welcome to Solo Stream Episode 2, Gem Cole's Enigmatic Enamel Bucket, Part 2, where once again I am joined by Chris Signore, Carson, Knuckles, Blue Pioneer, TT and P Studio, Enterprising Engine 93, and Terra 55 Stepney, aka Max Davis, to discuss Thomas Fan Media. Right, Caleb sure. Train asks, with the rise of access to YouTube growing amongst very young children, do you think there is an element of responsibility to be taken with content creators? I think it's important to keep Thomas to PG. In that sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember like on uh, in the early years, you know, there was a part where I think there was the yard, and that had a parent disclaimer. You know, there's so much bad, bad material in that, but I was old enough to kind of appreciate it and actually find it hysterical. Um, you know, those things like the, the, the paint yard scheme. Mm -hmm. and, your depression, whatever, and um, a lot of that humour was. I don't think you can get away with it now, but no, you wouldn't. Have. Obviously, but if you're gonna, if you need to, because one thing I tried to do, for example, with sort of rail car, and even try with, Pen with Henry Sad story was try not to use as much profanity as possible, because I think you can make something funny, you can make something great about um, about it, really. And so the rail car, I think, proved it because it was a step, as, as you said, and a lot of people said before, it's hysterical. And there was no swear words in it. Mm -hmm. Swear words aren't always funny. When you're including profanity in something, you've got to you've got to do it in an appropriate context, and you've got to make sure it's an appropriate setting. I mean, in granted, yeah, you can drop the f, you can drop the f bomb any, anywhere you like, but at the same time, it's only going to be in certain situations where it is actually appropriate and it is actually. Well, funny. Mm, that kind of depends, really. I mean, with YouTube, for some users, it's like no rule, so some could pretty much do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you do have to consider it's not just for you know older generations or teenagers watching this. It's also like younger kids, like today's generation, like the age of a girl for the TV series. Oh, today, yeah. you've got to consider. A parent might well be looking for Thomas content comes across something that looks like broadcast quality, like along the lines of what Carson does, and says, oh, that looks fun, and kind of finds it's not what they <laughs> expected. But some of the stuff that we did back in the day, we did kind of cross the line in a lot of ways, because we were more akin to using the potty mouth and the bad language. And oh, again, that's just me. Mm. So what I mean, what, what about the rest of you guys? What, what do you think... Um, do you, th do you think there is an element of responsibility to be taken with content creators um, on YouTube? I think it depends on the audience. I mean, yeah, I've, I've had comments on where I was a soda where people sort of whinged that there was a swear word in it. And in you, had, case, you had an episode where there was a, no, where there was a thing called the shit train. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's my don't, don't, don't bloody deny it, man. Can I ask a question? <laughs> yes. Can yeah. I ask? A genuine question. Yeah, sure. Jim, was the shit train a literal shit train, or was it like a good, dirty passenger train? Because I never could figure out if it was like literal or. <laughs> well, well or basically, not, the shit the shit train is um there's old coaches because they're not as prestigious as the big express ones. But later on, I kind of retconned oh. it a bit, say that it was a like a manure train or something. And later on, they just attrib attributed those smaller coaches to that train as like an insult, basically. Hmm. <laughs> That's pretty much how it felt. I guess yeah. we remember the giant caterpillar. I mean, like, yeah, the giant caterpillar is the pet climbing on that I mean, Carson, Matt, you, Max, you, you guys all produce stuff a little more akin to the audience. And do you guys feel there is um, accountability there, an element of responsibility to be taken? Honestly, I'm always wanting to cross the line, but I'm wary that, like, you know, the wrong kind of audience might stumble across it. Because I think on YouTube in general, like, some of the best videos are the ones that have the adult comedy, and it's just, like, there for a laugh, and uh, not twisting childhood, like, classics, but, like, you know, just having a different take on them. Um, but then some of the most popular videos are the ones that are literally just made for children and, like recreating the show so it's a really difficult balance to get right um, I would happily swear and have more like um, 
all the comedy on my channel, but I'm just worried that, like, yeah, the wrong kind of people would see it, and then, uh, you know, it doesn't end well. Mm. I think it depends on your intent as well, though. I mean, you yeah. know, some, mm. some of the comments I've had, whether some people whinge a bit because I swear, I just sort of said, well, my channel is my video, you know. Mm. Not actually kids' videos, they're my videos, but kids watch them. Mm -hmm. I mean, when yeah. we did the um, SAF Christmas specials, like the, um, the Christmas messages, we always had a disclaimer at the front, at least warning whoever watches it, there will be I content or language that would be, you know, unacceptable, but yeah, that's one way, another way of doing it. Well, Tales from, Tales from the Railway, can you do it any other, can you do it any differently? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Very much needed a disclaimer. Yeah. yeah. Favourite medium for Thomas fan stories, i.e. models, trains, Thomas Wooden Railway, audio, etc. And that's from Tidmouth Yard. I like both model railways and trains, particularly because it's another way of expressing yourself, rather than using footage because you're limited with that. And you kind of tell the same story, but model making, you can make it how you want it to. Especially now with trains, because now you've got so much variety in terms of you know, now people can make their own. Yeah, I mean, people are no, people doing it are absolutely doing amazing things with it. It's incredible. It's crazy because I remember I remember thinking in 2009 when I think Sean started making his own trains models and thinking I'd love to bring my own ideas to it. A lot of the things that weren't made before, or a lot of the things that we didn't have, where as it's so-called uh, railway series form, it's now been done, and it's been done many times in different variations. You kind of left with now what? I think I think if you're going to make stories, don't just stick to what's been done. Don't just stick to the whole Thomas guidelines. Make your own. Be inventive. Like. Yeah. Well, it kind of depends, really, what, what, what the mood takes you. I mean, for me, mostly, is um, I'm still happy to do like um, trains videos when I have to find the time. But I find audio has more freedom, where you can still picture what's going on, but yeah. having more create the freedom of how to edit sounds and voices and the like. Max, you work, you work with both models and trains. If you had to pick one, what one would it be? If I had to pick one, it would probably be models, because I feel there's a lot more room you can learn to improve with that, whereas trains, I think people sometimes dislike watching those sort of videos because they can become slightly like similar. Because obviously, when everyone starts with things, everyone starts with the same stuff. It's it's sort of what you do with it that uh, makes you stand out. But with models, like from the start, like you have your own style set, uh, whether you like it or not. Um, and obviously, there's so many different things you can do with models. Like uh, trains, I guess, might be slightly limiting too. But obviously, it's just a lot more time-consuming and uh, expensive. So on. No. Matt, obviously you're biased towards um, Thomas Wooden Railway, or am I wrong? <laughs> you're right, but I will say this, I love stop motion videos. Like, I don't use stop motion, but everyone who takes pictures to tell the story, I always click on those, no matter what range they are. I think they're fascinating. That's cool. Yeah. Hmm. Taylor, what about you? I'm pretty sure one of you guys said it, but... Every everything has like their strengths and weaknesses. Like trains, you can get more visual, but again, it does feel kind of repetitive, especially when they all kind of look similar. Um, um, models, models are like they look mostly accurate, but they're again they're sort of you're kind of limited on what characters you can have in your stories and whatnot. Whereas with like toys like the Take and Play, the Wooden Railway, Trackmaster. They have they pretty much made almost every character that's appeared in the show, so you could have a wider range of different stories with different characters, I guess. But they all just have their strengths and weaknesses. It's hard for me to choose one, even though I work with Take and Play. Mm. Mm -hmm. Carson, you work you work mainly with trains. I mean, what's your opinion on all this? I, you know, I don't really know if trains is my favorite. I love using it, and I love watching people who use it. But for me, I'm all about, like, model railways. Like, you know, those videos where they build the really nice sets, and you, they get the smoke going <laughs> under the table. That draws me in. I love stuff like that. Like, TARDIS Rescue stuff, I think, mm. is, like, my favorite stuff to watch in the fandom. I love his stuff so much. That includes custom-made custom models as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen a few wooden railway users have that steam effect as well. Mm -hmm. For me, personally, surprisingly, I mean, 
I've mainly done audio over the years, but I would honestly say my favourite medium to see Thomas fan stories produced has got to be through models. Mainly because it's so because it's so akin to the series. And if you get it right, you end up losing yourself in what you believe is real in this world that Absolutely. is being created. Yeah. But there are times when people can get it wrong. I can remember back in the mid noughties there was videos where you would see Thomas going along, you'd see this beautiful backdrop, blue skies, a hillside thing, and then then the next shot you would see someone's someone's spare room someone's bedroom and the cat soon the cat crawling across the crawling across the back of the screen. <laughs> and you're like the cat really adds to it. Yeah, the cat really player. adds to it, but it plays no part in the story, you know. Thomas and the <laughs> Thomas and the giant cat. <laughs> but Matt, falls I'm waiting for Watson to show up. <laughs> if you watch my series now, there's buffalo horns, bricks, glue pots, all sorts. Oh my mm -hmm. <laughs> you No know, like Godzilla style Thomas story. <laughs> Uh, Juki asks, what are some fan projects you saw what a or were a part of that either blew your expectations out of the water or fell below them? I can't really imagine anything that fell below expectations for me, but there have been some that part of that really just wowed me. I mean, what comes to mind is um, something semi-recent, Eric's forethought video. The amount of time and effort he put into editing his strange footage, you know, plus all my crazy talk animations of as part of it, it was just great fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, Crazy Talk, when done right, can add a lot more life to videos, whether it's with models or trains or anything, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Max, what about you? a bunch of behind-the-scenes stuff for Forethought, and he had, like, storyboarded a good chunk of it all by himself, just drawing out what he wanted to see on the camera. And uh, with trains, it's really different when you're on a Windows versus Mac. Uh, because of like the accessibility of a lot of the content you can use and how you can make the game look. And I learned that he was using Mac for it. And so the the video that he made and the quality of it, like on a Mac, like blew my mind. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've been there. I used to use Trains on a Mac myself, but in mm -hmm. recent years I switched back to Windows because Trains I just kept being laggy and crash occasionally. But with Windows Trains, even I'm using 2009, is all about making a bit of what you got, really. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, about well, about everyone else. Well, when anything that you guys have seen or been part of that um, blew your expectations or fell below them. The train killers. That was amazingly edited. Mm. <laughs> when I watched that, I was, I was watching, thinking this person must be the master of masking. It's just, it's, yeah. it's just crazy. That um, one definitely blew me. Yeah. One video that blew me was, um, I forget the name of it, but it was by Maroonham, or Maroonham. It was that Oliver sort of backstory with Jinty. Oh, yeah, he swung um, some. Yeah, Scotsman Returns. Yeah, that video. Oh, my God, I forget yeah. the title. But uh, that was really... It's, it's called... Uh, uh, Rest of Salvation or something. Well, that yeah, was the original title. I can't remember. Oh, The Little Westerner. It's the yeah, so, updated yeah. title, yeah. Yeah, that one... That one, I was really surprised with how good that one was. Yeah. I've been involved with uh, Kudak, Triple H stuff, uh, Kurt Kamina's. I think I say his name, Kamina? Yeah. Um, I was James in this project. He, it was kind of funny. He thought I sounded like Ringo Starr because I did a basic kind of... Um, and I don't think I sounded like Ringo. And he said, uh, you know what, you sound exactly like him. So I thought, well, if he wants me to do it, then I, I can't argue and it sounds like a really amazing it's an amazing project what he's produced is brilliant because it's exactly like it was from series one or series two and you know he's, he's made his what i'm talking about is his, his, his replica james mm -hmm. but one project that's really amazed me purely for and this is going back to what i was saying earlier about originality about stepping out of your comfort zone being completely different to the thomas guidelines is shed 17. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have got a lot of bad things to say about it, but and they have same people saying things scarred their childhood. 
it did for me, yeah. But at the same time, as time went on, I started to appreciate it more, and actually, I find it absolutely hilarious. I think it's some of the best things that have been written. It's almost media. Uh, tell her anything that you um, have been part of that blew your expectations or fell below them. I mean, Matt. Well, Matt, you always impress me with your content. <laughs> Um, well, if I had you, yeah, I'm just trying to think of who else there was. I guess um, Tobias and the Half Pariah by Times was enjoyable to watch. Yep. Oh, I agree with you on Tobias and the Half Pariah. Times is definitely one of the trains filmmakers that really makes himself. Oh. Well, Tobias and the Half One, it was so different and just the direct choreal style of the whole thing really set it apart from any before. It's like definitely one of the most distinct. I love Sudrian Conflict. It's a wooden railway and Lego series, and it does get a lot of flack because people start at the very beginning when Turtles was a lot younger and the series didn't have the production value, but it that it did at the end, but by the end of the series, like, you care so much about all of the characters, and it got very humorous, and and when I did the last episode with him, I was one of the cast members, we actually recorded our dialogue in the same room, so it was just really special to actually perform it recorded us talking to and use that for the final scene. And I was just so proud of how, like, being turned out. And last year, there was this Halloween story film with, called Stay Away from the Accordion Girl. Like, you had no idea what was going to happen. It had this very um, Stephen King kind of vibe to it. And I just went into it, like, actually spooked. It was really fun. Um, so those projects definitely you, you went into it not knowing what to expect and then it just blew the expectations up. So the Dark Towers was pretty surprised as well, I think. In terms of how how the um the, you know, the emotional quality of it. Richard really let that one go as a slow boil. I remember watching it for the first time and just being chilled. Just being really, really chilled to the bone. With the, with the ending of the first episode, I think if he'd left it there, it would have been absolutely perfect. Even going further into the episodes, the three episodes he did, it still ended quite strongly. It still ended pretty decently, I felt. I mean, it's aged all right, I felt. It's aged pretty well. Yeah, Dark Times was the first Thomas content I watched where, like, a character actually died, which that actually shocked me. Like, people are doing this? What? Yeah. Well, I mean, I can't really think of any fan production that really like wowed me because like people do some incredible things these days and they're really impressive to watch. I mean you guys have raised the production standard to exceptional levels and it's really crazy it's really crazy to see it getting to get into the stage that it is. No, I mean if I was to give you an answer I would be clutching at straws really. So I can't really think of one. White House Films, you know, um, he's asked a litany of questions um, for each one up for individually. Um, first one I'm going to start off with is for Gavin. Uh, Gavin, he says, most of the questions I wanted to ask you have already been answered in the past as we mostly talk on Skype or online. So here's a new one. If you were to go back in time, and change only one episode of your Railways and Sodor series, which one, would you, which one would you choose and why? That's a very creative question. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been put on the spot how to answer it quickly. Don't worry about answering it quickly, I can edit this thing. <laughs> Give me a sec. <laughs> oh man. Um, that's a difficult one. 
Because, I mean, if, really, I'd change them all, but if I have to pick one, it'd probably be number eight, because in terms of the series, number eight's definitely the, uh, the best one. But there's some real bad anachronisms in it that just didn't need to be there, like VR crests in the 30s, <laughs> things like that, you know? Just because towards the end of it, I was, I was burned out and there's so much work being done on it. I just wanted to get it done and obviously I had some oversights and uh, things like that. There wasn't really any need. I mean, I went to the lens and tried to put correct lamp irons on to get the head code and trying to synchronize the exhaust beats and all sorts of stuff like that. So probably that. Just polish episode eight more. Okay. Don't have the mechanisms, and then I think that'll be it. Uh, Christopher, which fan site production did you have the most fun being part of? Ooh, well, Soda Studios was good. Just the collaborative we had between all of us. Mm -hmm. But um, that's pretty much it, really. I mean, as you say, so many to choose from, but Soda Studios was the most fun. Just basically, just playing around with how to tweak a story or what more can I do to up my game regarding editing and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And again, it's just, you know, from small acorns grow big trees. Mm -hmm. Matt, you have been, he's, he asks here, you've been to many locations to film your videos. Do you have a particular favourite location that you found worked so well in your videos? Yes, um, I went to Newport, Rhode Island for the first time a few years ago. And it was this beautiful beach. All you could see was the sky and the ocean from every angle. There were no real life distractions. And the engines actually looked like they were in their own world. And it was a beautiful day. That was definitely my favorite. Mm -hmm. Is that the place where you met the nude sunbather? What? No. <laughs> I ran into a nude sunbather at the lake where they filmed Friday the 3rd there. And the oh, wow. guy just walks over and <laughs> he didn't see me though. So when he came up and saw that there was someone with toy trains on the beach, he was a little startled. <laughs> Matt, were you filming James goes on a streak or whatever it is during that time? Ironically, months before I had released a nudist colony episode and then <laughs> You know, it manifested. It like came true. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. The truth is strengthened in fiction. <laughs> Max, when you're doing a model project for YouTube, what areas do you find the most difficult to work with in terms of filming your models? Hmm, that's interesting. Anything in the past, to be honest. <laughs> um, present day is okay because you can sure include the most things because you know especially if you're saying it's preservation era then anything can turn up like engine wise and stuff anything in the past is difficult because you do want to pay attention to getting the right models to um just to make it seem a little bit more accurate you know some people might not even notice but um yeah it, it just sets the tone a little bit more if you've got uh, period accurate models but it's not always just able to do that, um, especially in the 1800s, because like, the landscapes are so much more bare, very difficult to um, make sure you've got models to fill any empty space where, where it would be built up on in later years. Okay, cool. Um, one for me, out of all the audio productions I have produced, not uh, Ryan has produced, which one would you say I was not, he's asked me here, out of all the your out of all the, your audio productions, which one would you say you are pr the proudest of in terms of how it all came together? For me, it's very difficult to answer that one because over time, I progress. I mean, I progress so much um, in terms of my audio editing, editing. In terms of the sto in terms of the stories that I've done, Super Rescue stands out. The whole of the Branchley engines thing stands out as well, but if I was to pick one, it would have to be SIF crossover adventure, just mainly because of the scale that it all just came together on. Maybe Tin with Lightning Bolt as well. I don't, I couldn't really tell you, but I'm really enjoying doing history of the Yellow Railway just now, purely because 
team we were experimenting so much we're doing so much stuff that we've never actually done before like we're actually specifically recording background noise for it now um chris you'll remember when we were in ireland um in the 2015 start of 2016 a few of us went out into the out into the hall of the house it was a house on its own no neighbors for miles and we just ended up screaming and shouting for ages um because we're doing a we're doing episode four we'll have sections of talking head scenes set in a nursing home and you've got yes i still want to break cross of nurse 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 what is it <laughs> i need a new bed pack drawn from experience you know years what in the mental health years what in the mental health it's so oh, but yeah i would honestly say i love them all because they're each special in their own way but if you were to put a gun in my head it would probably be um crossover adventure purely because i learned so much doing that one and super rescue as well uh carson sim which of your productions are you the most proud of in terms of how it all went together well i've said this earlier in uh in this i really loved my haunted henry videos that i did because i am a massive sucker for season five and one of my biggest um goals with my channel is to remake all of season five or at least a good chunk of it in my Ooh. style and changing up the stories and doing my own thing with it and so haunted henry is the video uh... for me that really brought me really close with a lot of people i mentioned uh... that it made that it uh... created my video workshops for where it's this uh... group of friends that i have and they all we all uh, share each other's projects and videos and stuff, and we'll all brainstorm ideas, and we'll all create things for each other, and we all just come together and help each other out with whatever project we're all working on at the time. And so, uh, for Haunted Henry, that was really one of the big things that jump-started that, because uh, I had Mike, uh, like the buried truck, and then my friend Derek, who's Curiosity Peaks, they helped me write the thing, and then, oh yeah, I can't forget Duncan. My friend Duncan helped me come up with the idea for Haunted Henry a couple years ago. And then uh, my friend Fabian made me the the Henry and Gordon model that you see in it. My friend Xavier made me the new trucks and Edward and James in it. And they just look so great and it really made me happy and I really appreciate all of them. And, you know, it's just a really good video to look back on because of all how long it went really preparing everything for that and all the friends I made along the way and yeah. Sure. What's your uh, YouTube channel because I'd like to watch it. Here. Uh, it's it's Carson with a bunch of numbers. I know you more than likely will not remember. Most people don't so I sent I sent the link in the uh, in the group chat. Ah cool. I don't know. Um, Jamtram asks, which characters do you find the most challenging to write for and why? Honestly, like, although they're kind of my favourite characters to write for, I, I also find them very difficult as the scholarly characters. Seriously? Like, yeah, funnily enough, I love writing for them so much, I don't want to keep doing it. But when I am, I feel like I'm the most careful. Um, I feel like they're sort of like precious ground, you sort of like... Uh, you have to get it right because people really sort of respect those characters. Well, of course you they respect us. Of course they respect yeah. those characters. <laughs> yeah, see, I trust a lot in you voicing Scarlet. It's, 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 uh, I love doing it. I love doing. I mean, I love doing it for you. I love doing the character because it's so different from other ones I've done before. I mean, like yeah. I mean, you used to do Gordon quite regular, and I mean, I'm, I'm loving doing the narratives because I get to do all sorts of different voices. But yeah, I mean, I love doing I love doing Scarloy, and there's a lot mm -hmm. of things that I really want to try and incorporate in there as well, just for for that yeah, I mean, character. Some of the things you have have made it into my episode. Yeah. So. yeah. What about anyone else? Does anyone else find certain characters difficult to write for? I think Gordon is in one sense. Um, 
because the character is so well established, it seems to be difficult to write any line without it seeming like he's having a pop with somebody. And the same for James and Henry sometimes. Always like bickering. Mm. So to try and write something where they seem less, you know, like they're not sniping so much at each other. I don't know. You just don't see it often. It doesn't seem to come naturally. I mean, I would assume that writing any character would be kind of hard because you got to get their personalities right. Otherwise, people will complain about it or it just won't feel right, you know? Mm-hmm. Yes, especially when it comes to like, um, the one-off characters like Neville and Dennis. You try to develop certain characters for that one episode of opinion, but at the same time, with some characters have hardly any character all to work with, it's trying to get into their mind thinking how it would react to a certain situation or storyline, you know? Personally, I mean, whenever I've, I mean, if there's a character I don't really get, I don't really understand to, you know, to try and write for, I just don't write for them at all. So it's the easiest, that's the easiest way of getting around it, I mean, but I don't see or feel that there is any character within the series that I couldn't write for in one way or another. I mean, even with the extended railway series, it's just a matter of trying to get, I mean, get the character down and work on it. Although I do enjoy seeing what other people's take on certain characters are. Matt, is there any characters that you find particularly difficult to write for in terms of your, your series and that kind of thing? I think Percy's difficult because in the show, his personality has changed over the years, where he was kind of like a goofball and jokester, and then in season five, he was the most underappreciated and overworked employee, <laughs> and then now he's sort of the innocent child of the group, and when I write for him, I want to honor all three of those things, but they're all very different. Mm -hmm. You can say the same thing for characters like Henry, too, where he was kind of, like, arrogant, I guess, in the early, in the Runaway series and early TV series, but then became, I guess, more of a scaredy cat in the CGI and hit era. Oscar asks, dream collaboration, who would it be with? Well, I'd definitely like to collab with Danny Long. I mean, his mm. videos with models and trains are just outstanding. It'd be really nice if people and I could collaborate on a script together. But I'd, I'd like to get involved with some of the, like, the younger generation regarding um, fan media, like Crassiness, for example. I will use some of your train videos. It'd be nice to you know, do something together one time and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. I'd be done. Yeah, sure. Cool. I mean, I would, when I start writing my own like original ideas, I would like to get more voice talent. Because I've actually had Matt and Max as voices before for my Christmas video. It's just, I guess now, just trying to get more people involved, you know? Yeah, you're still open. You're open. I'm open to doing stuff. If I could work with White House Films and Corbs and Titus Rescue all at once, some decent model type of, uh, like, you know, Soto sort of thing, that'd be good. Because between all, all of us, there's that many skills, I think, for this style, it would work out really well. Cool. Matt, what about you? Would anyone else, anyone you'd like to collaborate with? I mean, I know you've done quite a lot of collaborative work over the years in terms of Creator Collective, your classics, classic series yeah, creations, I think it is, that. you call it? Yeah, it's called Classic Series Creations, and I didn't create it. I do a lot of work for it, but it was created by Jolly Good Idea Films, right. who I found out lived five minutes away from me. So it's very easy to collaborate with him. I can just take a little drive down the road. Um, yeah. I... Yeah, everyone seems to live five minutes away from you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dream collaboration. Um, you know, I would love to work with the Boston and Buffer sets in like a in a serious or goofy fashion. Cool. Personally, in terms of dream collaboration, I would just love to I mean I would just love to get everyone who used to do it back in the day back together again. I mean, in terms of the voice talent and 
possibly do something with the younger generation because you guys, you guys have hit the pinnacle of production, whereas we are, I mean, whereas we are just totally down in terms of voice and audio skills. So I would love, I mean, I would love to do something with you guys at some point mm-hmm. if there's any possibility of that happening. Well, I mean, it's already yeah. happened. It's already happened in a small way with Max because I mean, I've done audio editing for you one point. When was that? Was, yeah. Was that? Yeah, that was 2017, cool. wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Jeez, I really need to get back into doing this again. <laughs> I miss <laughs> it so much. Right, Mr. Merlin Fan O Two asks, "What things do the older creators think that the younger creators have incorporated into their own content that they did back in the day?" You make videos, same. <laughs> <laughs> make videos. <laughs> um, this, I mean, a lot has a lot has changed, right? In terms of what being what we did, right? What we did was basic. What you guys are doing, you have got. There's, the technology's improved. You guys have developed your own skills and ways of doing things. So I, I really don't know. I really don't know. It's it's definitely it's difficult to say because like everything that we did back in the day, you guys are doing it, but arguably better. Yeah, I can't argue there. Yeah, I can't. I, mean, I can't uh, just. I just assume you just watch older content for inspiration and try to just put your own spin on it regarding different your own talents and skills. That's what I think, anyway. Gavin, you any opinions on this? I mean, do you mean like in the sense of what some of us done and then what the new people are doing that we did? Is that kind of what you mean? Yeah. With the new series, um, I don't think it was a first, but I was, I was one of the first to put smoke effects on in sort of these... Um, Plaster cast faces, you know, and crazy talk. Well, I don't think it was the first, but definitely one of the first if it wasn't. And um, I saw that been been used quite a few times, so I'd say that was a few things that were done. Jerome asks as well, what do the older creators think of how fan content has evolved over the years? I think it's done better than we've done. <laughs> yeah. Oh, naturally, yeah. I think I think some of the humour is going away a bit, and it's um, it's much more independent than it was because it felt like you had to be part of Sif to make something that got anywhere. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But now on YouTube, it's it's expanded. It's now a lot of fan fan projects have kind of gone their own direction, and there's loads of people that we've never got. I never got to meet or hear of. Who have um, come out of the woodwork, hmm? and they've actually produced some really amazing things. Yeah, I kind of disagree there. Personally, I'm in favour of it. I mean, I think you guys have basically taken the ball and run with it. I think he's done. I think he's do, Yeah, I think he's have done a fantastic job, and I wish it health to keep going with it. Because I mean, it's just there is no no one settles no one settles for basic production you guys are constantly developing you're constantly pushing yourselves to do better to do it dinner to do it differently and that's important yeah so what were you what were you guys what, chris gavin what do you think no, yeah, i think you summed it up perfectly mate yeah. oh. no i was going to say obviously like you said it always improving um doesn't matter what you do, you always try and improve it, and then you think of a new technique. How can I do this? How can I make that better? Then you might see somebody else do something. Yeah. And then you take the article and hone it and modify it, and, and it just incrementally gets better. And of some of the stuff that nowadays, like I said, some of the edits now I'm looking at, I'm like, wow, I really wish you know I could do that. Or well, maybe later I can when I get back into it. But yeah, some of the new stuff's very inspiring, definitely. Yeah, good. And the Milan Tuner asks, was there ever anything you wanted to do with your series that you never got the chance to do? Um, I think that pretty much goes out to everyone. Well, personally, when we, um, let's see, 
I remember a while ages ago, I like for the tenth anniversary of Soda Island Forums, I think Ryan came up with the idea of doing adapted one of these extended Rowie series books, um, Express Engines, into like a feature length movie, which told it all into the Soda Castle being brought to Soda. It would be nice if it could be done to have, you know, trained adaptations of extended Rowie series stories done. I mean, I'd love to do it myself, but just finding the time and, you know, someone willing yeah. to render models, really, whether it's by commission or, you know, anything, really. That's one of the things I'd like to do myself if I had more time and, you know, less concerns in my life. I wish I finished. I, I did. Henry's sad story, I wish I didn't rush to get finished. Because if you listened throughout most of it, so many lines were wrong. And you can actually hear me improvising to fill those gaps in. And in particular, I mean, this is this is done by accident, but the bit when uh, the girl, the woman, goes, just make it quick. And the back controller goes, we're doing the best we can, my good man. That was an accident. Yeah. That wasn't part of the script. I mean, it was funny because it, it was funny and it made everyone laugh because everyone's always said to me, but that was actually a, a genuine accident because I, I gave um, that line to Carly uh, sorry, Rusty Fanatic 05. And I, ha- I've forgotten who was Passenger 1, who was Passenger 2, sort of thing. If that makes sense. Right. And this is, I mean, but I guess, like, you know, I keep looking at the train stuff, and I do think, I do wish I could have, um, sometimes I look at them and I wish, I wish I made those, because, but at the same time, you kind of, sometimes you drift out of the interest of Thomas, and sometimes you get back into Yeah. It. Yeah, I mean, it happens for the best, is it? The best of times. No, it's more characters, really. Yeah. I mean, if you look at all the custom sort of characters that I've made or, or bashed over the years and Hornby and all the rest of it, I haven't actually made that many because I spend so long just trying to perfect each one or redoing them. So, in some ways, I regret that. You know, it would have been nice if I just got some more made. But, you know, that could still happen in time. The thing, the thing is, with this question, there's none of it being like Chris, and I mean, granted, Chris, you, me, we all kind of. We just kind of stop. We kind of stop doing it, but we never stop doing it all together. I mean, there is still time to do other things, um, but in terms of productions that I wanted to, I mean, I wanted to do, but never actually got off the ground. Uh, and it was I had two, I had about three that I wanted to do, but never actually, fit, never actually got got around to doing. One of them was the last, I mean, we were going to put the tin lid on the Sif Adventures run about 2010. I trusted Loey Mackin to write the script with Kate now, but he never did it. So, and then by that point, everyone who we were doing it, everyone who we were working with in terms of voice cast at that time, just decided, you know what, I'm no, I mean, I'm, I'm going to give this up. I'm, I've, I mean, I've got other things in my plate. And just that kind of thing. So that was that was one that was one of them. No, that I cannot recall. I mean, I think the so I mean the the Express Engines film as well. I really wanted to do that, but you know, just things got in the way. Um, I do. I mean, funny enough, actually, I've got at least seven audios that I've never I mean that are sitting there almost ready to go just need to piece to get just need to be pieced together um from the last variety pack and I've actually got a Tugs audio episode which just needs dub no, which just needs sound effects dubbed into it and I've got two other episodes waiting to go which could have put in which could have acted as a finale to that so I'm just I'm really sad that Tugs Audio has never got not, never got finished, but you never know what could happen in the future. Mm. I mean now people have answered the Tugs music like Ace of Trains. Also the possibility to up the um soundtrack there. Yeah, exactly. Arcade Player One asks. What or who do we have to sacrifice to get one giant collaboration between all the guests here? <laughs> I'm game. <laughs> I would do it. I'm game. Yeah, why not? I'm in. Cool. Sure. Sure. Good day. There you go. 
Can't agree with Go. Well, that's all we've got time for this time. Thank you very much for all your fan questions and join us again for part three when we will be discussing models, redubs, audios, trains, movies, fan reviews and magazine shows, favourite pieces we've produced so far and much more, as well as the future of fan content. If you're interested in more, please visit Soder Island fan site at www.soderelland.com Soder Island Forums at SoderIslandForums.com Or you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and subscribe to us on YouTube and SoundCloud. Links to the YouTube channels and Twitter profiles of my guests are available in the description below. Thank you very much for listening and we'll see you next time.